Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free trial at www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co slash PMC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Next up on our event schedule is the Planet Microcap Showcase virtual on December 6th through 8, 2022. On day one of the event, we'll be hosting the first ever Stock Pitch World Cup. Five global areas, five moderators, 20 total stock pitches. Joining us to moderate each special session is Maj Swedan representing the USA, Paul Andriola representing Canada, Fadi Diab representing Australia, Jason Hirschman representing Europe, and Kelvin Sito representing Asia. The only way to see the Stock Pitch World Cup is by registering now. And then on day two and three will be presentations from microcap management teams, as well as an opportunity to conduct one-on-one meetings. Attendance for the Planet Microcap Showcase virtual is complimentary for investors and registration is now open. So to join us, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. Now for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Brian Weber, general partner at BRW Investors. I've known Brian for a few years now, and we actually did a fun panel in 2021 with fellow guests of the show, Chris Krug and Artem Foken, discussing microcap due diligence in the virtual world. Brian is as active a microcap investor as it gets, who I I think has the record or is right up there for doing the most one-on-one meetings, at at least at our events in the last few years. In our discussion, we talk about his background, where we have similar inspirations for getting into microcaps. Shout out to both our dads. But one key part of the conversation and why I titled this episode what I did is because microcap companies can have a tendency to chase that carrot or trend that investors are flocking to. We chat about what separates the companies that are prepared to carrot chase versus those who are just going to keep on chasing. So thank you again for tuning in to episode 249 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Brian Weber. This episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense. You can find them at streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co backslash PMC. Stream is an expert interview transcript library that is starting to become an integral part to investors' research process. They have a number of interviews on a wide variety of companies, including TMT, consumers, industrials, real estate, and more. Stream provides over 300 expert interviews per week, and 70% of their experts are found exclusively on Stream. Stream is unlike any other transcript libraries. Stream integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Stream's community of experts and thought leaders partner with Stream to build their professional brands and expand their industry influence. Right now, there are approximately 8,500 plus call transcripts available. For more information, please visit www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.co backslash PMC. Brian, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing well, Bobby. Thanks for having me on here. It's great to have you, man. Look, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record to everybody where, you know, this long overdue and everything, but I, in, in our case, it actually really is because, I mean, look, we've known each other for a few years. You, unfortunately, we haven't met in person yet, but like, you you know, we've talked quite a bit. You've attended 
you know, all of our recent uh, virtual events, uh, uh, thousands of meetings with with companies. And, uh, you know, you clearly have a passion for micro cap investing. So this is long overdue for sure. So I appreciate you again jumping on. And um, I figured we'd dig right in, man, because, uh, you know, uh, and from our from talking offline and, you know, our experience getting to know each other, I know you you have deep roots in looking at micro caps. You, you love it. You, this is this is your passion. So, you know, I'd love to know where all of that began. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so, so I guess in some ways, I would say I was like born in this business. I know that sounds kind of corny, but, you know, like just rewinding the clock, you know, my, my, my dad, Alan Weber, has been a very successful small microcap investor for 30 plus years. So, so I kind of had the luxury of really growing up and seeing this really early, early on in life. So like really rewinding the clock back, let's say middle school, I had absolutely no idea what he did every day for a living. <laughs> like I just remember some fun like perks like you know, getting like he was an investor in this uh, sports marketing company. So we, we got like season, we got, we got, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? tickets for, you know, like the Elite Eight, Final Four. And that was because he was an investor in a company. And I was always like, wow, this is cool. Like, you know, you get free stuff. Like, like I literally had no idea, like, at all, like what, what the job entailed or what, what it was, what, what you do. But I would say, like, by high school years, you know, maybe like junior, senior year of high school. I, I took an elective class called investments and marketing, which was like my first kind of foray into really understand, like to, to really think about what, what does it take to build a portfolio? So that was like kind of a class where you just learn basic stuff, but everyone in the class managed like a million dollar fake virtual portfolio, let's say. And that was like kind of the first time where I felt like me and my, like I would come home from school every day and was so excited to talk about like what I owned in the portfolio. And I just thought everybody, you know, like, like I just really, it really just started solidifying my love for kind of, you know, investing. I just really, you know, and then, and then obviously grew, that led to more conversations at the dinner table. You know, my dad really was really helpful kind of in understanding kind of the rule 72, like co compounding, just how compounding works. And like, I just felt like that was all just like kind of setting the stage for when I eventually worked at, when I was in college, you know, obviously had an interest still was a little undecided what I want to do, but you know, eventually it kind of led me to that path because I interned at Robati and Company, um, which was just an amazing experience and just really great culture and just kind of kept with the investment bug and just never stopped and looked back. Absolutely. And and by the way, we, we share that in common. You know, my father was, uh, you know, came from Wall Street on more on the deal side, you know, as an investment banker. But, you know, also sharing that same experience of like, you know, I didn't know what he did all the time, you know, like just didn't yeah. know. But then, you know, as you got, I was like, oh, okay, that that's what that means. Especially now being in the business for 11 plus years. I'm like, oh, got it. Investment banking. That's what you do. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's I have so many follows, even just from your your experience, you know, and, and we'll get to some of the lessons learned when, when as an intern at Rabadi and, and doing some of the work that you're still doing there. Um, but what else from from your dad when when he recognized that you had this interest? You know, what he, What did he do to help support that? Because, you know, look, as a, as a father myself, I'm sure there's others that, you know, who are listening in that have, you know, either young kids or they're growing up and maybe want them to have some interest or understanding of investing. Like, what did he do to help support this initial passion that you had? Yeah, so I think early on, he would always, you know, definitely include me in events, like even when I was an intern at Rabati or even, I think, yeah, like when I was a senior in high school, like right before I was about to graduate, you know, we went to visit my cousin in Boston and uh, he brought me to like my first one-on-one -on -one meeting when I was in high school. So like he let me just sit there, listen, absorb everything. But yeah, so, so, so he just was always really accommodating with his time, uh, showed me some books that he really liked, you know, that, that were helpful. Like even some of the Buffett Berkshire annual meeting letters were always really helpful just to kind of like start off. And he was just, always and then you know just sitting down at the dinner table understanding how compounding works like i was saying before the rule 72 like just some basic kind of principles and just yeah and then just really like just being a good soundboard for ideas and pitching him stuff and never kind of dismissing it the one the thing he was always really good at i would say is like the idea or the name or strategy might not work might not be something he's interested in but he never dismissed it you know like he was always like very practical in the sense where everyone has their own way of investing and whatever works for one person might not work for the next or might work for the other, but like he would never say it was a bad idea. So I, I think just being open-minded and just 
all that stuff really helped kind of shape the type of investor I wanted to become. Awesome. Person too. Awesome. I mean, you know, and then going from there, obviously, by the way, that I, I love the fact that, you know, you had your, your dad was just so supportive of you and, you know, I'm sure he was pumped, right? Like my kids really pumped, like stoked on micro cap stocks. Like, it's like the most difficult thing to get any kid pumped on. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's be real, right? I mean, yeah. fact that I even landed here. I'm like, you know, but, you know. It, well, it's funny. It's funny you say that. He used to always say, like, what he does for a living is like watching paint dry. Because he's like a very value focused. Like, he'll own stuff for years, and like, it might in the short term, it might it might really not work out, and it might be like, you might at the time be like, wow, this is never going to work out. Like, this is going to take forever. Like, 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 what am I doing? Like, kind of like. You know, it's just that patience. He was a very patient person when it comes to like just what to own and what to hold, sort of. And I think that resonates well with some of the good traits I I was able to put into my own career. Yeah. Can you imagine if like you were in like your formative years, like just getting started investing in the last two years, like him as this like patient value investor being like, <laughs> my kid's going to get lost in this like meme stock, like growthy, like crazy environment. Like, how do I, how do I break him? Or he might, or I, or probably, or I mean, if I was like, you know, that parent in that situation, it's like, all right, go learn. Here you go. You yeah. Know? And I think, I think that's, that's like the most important thing too. It's, it's like, you know, you see kind of when I was joining those one-on-one -on -one meetings with my dad, even if I didn't know anything he was talking about, like you still pay attention to the names that you meet with. And like over time, you know, maybe it was four or five years later, some of these ideas were big winners. I mean, there were losers too, obviously like everyone else, but. But there was some, it just, you know, like gravitated my mind towards like this process works. You just got to stick with it even when it doesn't work and just, you know, stay focused and not let the day to day kind of bother you. For sure. For sure. All right. So then let's, let's talk about, you know, I, I guess uh, Robotti was your first, first gig. You're still doing work there as well. You know, Bob Robotti, who's the, the founder and, and, you know, had Honcho over there, you know, he's a legend as well in micro caps. I mean, what were some lessons that you learned and that, maybe affected your own investing philosophy being able to work every day with Bob. Yeah. Yeah. I think working for Bob has been an unbelievable rewarding experience in a lot of ways because, you know, he, he has a similar approach to the way my dad does things like very valuation focused, very like, you know, very focused on management, spends a lot of time, like really getting to know the companies in his own way without like, yeah. So, so, so he's, he's, but he's a little bit more focused on, I would say cyclical businesses. So commodity businesses, energy, housing, industrials. And so he kind of taught me this, like to kind of stay open-minded sort of, because, you know, with how I kind of run my own business and my own ideas and my own portfolio today, it's, it's like, I, I have this like bias towards not really dismissing things as maybe other people, like some people were like for a long time, they don't want to own energy stocks. They don't want to own anything that has to do with energy because it hasn't worked. But I guess just, seeing kind of and, and hearing kind of the lessons and just being around him, you know, the way learning kind of what type of questions he asks, he's very, you know, detail oriented. So he knows a lot about the businesses that he invested in these, in these more cyclical industries. So I think all that just kind of was really just an unbelievable kind of learning experience. And just early on too, he just lets, you know, young people, whether they're interns or myself at that point was young, he lets them listen in on his calls. So like, like, like just to get experience for them. They don't, we don't ask questions, that's but awesome. we, can, we, can, we have the opportunity to listen. And I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, that's what people spend a lot of money to get an MBA for or something like that, is just to have those experiences to like be around people that were successful in their field. And he's been doing it also for 40 something years. And, you know, he's just very caring with good. He's, he's, a, he's a caring guy and just very good with his time. And so that all kind of brought me to, I guess, my first job really. Actually, yeah. So, so, so I worked on the broker dealer side at Robati uh, Securities for, and I still do where I, I talked to other hedge funds, other kind of smaller investment funds and just would pitch them ideas. And some of them would be kind of the Rabati ideas and some of them would be my own ideas that, you know, I came across. And so I think that was like kind of like a real boot camp type of thing into both sales and also just uh, being, you know, just, just being able to really talk to a lot of smart people. A hundred percent. Hey, listen, you got to put in a good word with Bob, man. We'd love to have him on here too. All right. So, yeah, he definitely, yeah, I definitely will. And he definitely would love to be on here too. Oh, that's awesome. That's I'll cool. make it happen. I got uh, you. I love <laughs> it, man. I love it. But you first, man, you know, listen, we're, we're, <laughs> we're the, we're the OG homies first. So let's think. So let's dig into your philosophy and strategy a little bit, right? Like clearly value oriented, right? Long-term 
looking for that good quality fundamental business. So, I mean, that that in, in a nutshell is probably your investing philosophy. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anything that we're missing there? Yeah. So I would say I'm looking for, as a starting point, I like to look at like statistically cheap stocks on, you know, let's say that earnings, cash flow, free cash flow, like, you know, as a starting point, sort of just to kind of like, it's a good starting point right now. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I like to look for things that screen cheap that other people probably will not really care about and will be like, oh, it's a value trap or I have no interest. And, and, and they might ignore the fact that maybe this is, it's a different business in some ways. Maybe the industry consolidated. Maybe, you know, maybe it's, they have a new management team. Maybe they have, you know, like maybe they just had a tough few years in the industry for like whatever reason and they're in a better footing today. Maybe they had too much debt and now, and now they've, improve their balance sheet. So like as a starting point, I like to look for really out of favor. I've always been like that, just really contrarian out of favor type industries and ideas. And then from there, I would kind of keep a long list of ideas that I've like at least read or have come across, listen to the presentation. And I kind of go like one by one and just look through each one. And then if it, I thought it was interesting, I'd reach out to, you know, whether it's the management team or investor relations and get kind of like an intro kind of on the company and you know, and, and, and just really from there, I would kind of combine that with just obviously continuing my due diligence, reading transcripts, reading as much information as I can out there on the company. And then, you know, I think what also makes my strategy somewhat unique is I'm not like pretending like I'm an overly, like I, I, I would say I'm more diversified in some ways. Like I have a lot more positions than probably the average fund does or, or person. But I think that also like kind of manages risk to some extent because you know we're investing in kind of risky securities at the end of the day. I mean, even though th- even though they're cash flow generating and they look cheap and whatnot, but I mean, you know, sometimes they have a lot of debt. Sometimes they there's something there's like one or two things that could go wrong with it. It could go bankrupt. So I think you know I, I don't mind taking a small position in a company after I kind of go through the beginning part of the ch- the, the process, like read read all the materials, spoke to management, think the risk versus reward is good. I want to get to know it better. So I, you know, I think I, and, and, and I'm looking for kind of that similar kind of characteristics among different industries, like not just, I don't want to own everything in like one industry. I'm willing to look at kind of, you know, a, any industry basically that like kind of fits the checkbox of, is it cheap statistically and can it grow? Like what is the market kind of missing here? You know, that's kind of the process in a nutshell, just trying to buy things that can grow, but, but the market doesn't really like today, I guess that are really out of favor. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, no, hey, the, the classic contrarian look. Well, it's actually a spin on contrarianism. It's not like full contrarian, you know, but it but it, it's like it has it has elements of that. It's like, okay, this is completely hated, but they're still generating free cash flow. Like, what am I missing here? What's what's the alpha? Right. In, in, in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, okay. it's 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 exactly like that. Yeah. Just you know, just willing to kind of very focused on yeah, cash flow and earnings and just how can that how can that grow and just thinking about the different variables of like whether you know that earnings or cash flow stream is going to be consistent or will grow over time and then you know kind of putting it all together to kind of thinking about five years from now like what is the business going to look like you know what's the earnings power what's the cash flow look like and that's kind of it in a nutshell gotcha and you kind of alluded to my next question a little bit already too here but what what does that quote-unquote ideal investment look like for you that what, what's some of your criteria yeah so i guess ideally would be just kind of like I said, it, it's, it, it would be ideally it would be somewhat cheap off of today's numbers, like cheap off of today's numbers, let's say. So maybe it's showing up as like six or seven times free cash flow. And I really think that there's a pathway for that number to grow, you know, for, for various different reasons. And so like you're really buying it if you look out a few years at like two or three times free cash flow. Uh, so that, you know, and, and, and you're not really, I don't really play the multiple game. Like, like I'm not really focused on, like if a multiple expansion happens, like that's great, but I'm like more focused on like the core kind of like what's the pathway to grow their earnings or like free cash flow, like I said, like, and, and, you know, I don't really give things crazy multiples when I think about what is it worth, but if you're buying something at two or three times, you know, a few years out free cash flow and, and you, you know, even attach a reasonable multiple, it seems like you should make decent money. Like, it just seems like, like the business will probably, if you're right about it, it probably won't be trading at two or three times in a few years anyway. So, you know, I, I think that that kind of sums it up. Very good. All right. So I want to talk a little about your, your research process as well, because I mean, like, like I said, you've participated in a number of our virtuals over the years. You've probably, I, I don't know who has the record between you and Chris Krug or, or Artem for the most uh, one-on-ones uh, for the last couple of years, but we actually, the three of the, the four of us did a pod together 
um, I think it was last year where we, we all kind of talked about the importance of doing one-on-ones and, and kind of turning over every rock and talking to management teams, you know, so for you, why is that so important? And at what point in your process do you prefer to go in and start talking to management teams or do you not mind just doing cold one-on-one to say, hey, okay, let me take a look and see if this is interesting. Yeah. So I, I guess it kind of varies. Like I, I you know, I'm, like I said, I'll initially read like the 10 K or the annual report and just want to have a fundamental understanding of what the business does and see if it's like something I would be interested in. So like, I try not to go into meetings like completely blind where I don't really know anything about the company or the financials or anything like that. Cause I, I mean, but even some of those meetings, like, you know, you probably will find some, you know, find something interesting that will probably, whether it's about the industry or the company that might be helpful for something else. But I mean, it's not a good use of your time to just go into meetings completely blind. But I would say, you know, I'll, I'll come up with a list of companies I'm interested in. Like I said, I'll read the, I'll, I'll go through each one and then I'll, I'll kind of circle back and kind of go through, um, you know, and be like, I want to talk to management of this company, that company, this company I'm not interested in. I, you know, I have a red check on it because I, you know, I, I read it and I didn't think it would it really fit the, on a first glance, fit the parameters of something I'd be interested in. So I, I think early on, I'm happy to kind of get on the phone with management, whether, but investor relations is helpful too, like I said, because they usually have a pretty good understanding of the business. And sometimes that's all I, I want. I just have questions about, it's, you know, the history, but sometimes it's more granular detail questions. And that's when it makes sense to, you know, go to the CFO or I, or, you know, CEO and have a more direct conversation. So, you know, I don't, I don't need to talk to the management team every quarter of a company that I'm an investor in, but I generally want to like walk away from that first or second meeting where I'm like, the strategy makes sense. This guy, like, knows what he's doing and I kind of believe in it. Like I wouldn't really want to invest in a company where I didn't believe that I think I thought management was capable of doing something. It doesn't mean I'm not wrong about it a lot of times or like everyone else, but generally like that's why management's important to my process is because I want to like at least, you know, walk away kind of feeling like this guy is the right guy for the job sort of. For sure. And, and for you, I mean, look, we're talking about microcaps, right? And there's a lot of great salesmen people out there, right? I mean, phenomenal. Um, we've talked to, we probably talked to both our, our fair share, you know, folks that, you know, are great salespeople, you know, as, as management teams that, you know, um, you know, look, they, some execute, most don't, um, for one reason or another, sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes it is. Um, but I mean, for you, what, what is some of your tricks to help folks discern, or at least for you to discern between, and this kind of snake oil salesman versus like, all right, they're just passionate and they really believe in the future prospects of the business. Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. I think that's what, you know, it comes down to at the end of the day. But I mean, I think part of what, going back to like my investment framework and kind of what makes it kind of different, like I'm not, I'm not really give it, paying a big multiple. I'm not trying to pay a big multiple for really high expectations today. You know, like I'm, I'm looking for things that are, like I said, it's pretty out of favor and the bar is kind of low sort of. So that's already kind of like a starting point. Like I'm not looking for something trading at, you know, really 20 times earnings today that like if they're wrong about it, it's going to go down 80%, 90%, you know, like, like, like just because the multiple was just wrong. But I'm looking more for things that are statistically cheap, that the bar is low. And if, if, if management, you know, is reasonable, I think that they can, you know that that this, that they can really be successful in kind of turning around the business or improving the earnings or cash flow, and that that's kind of that's kind of how I think about it actually. Absolutely. So I, I asked the same question to both Chris and Artem uh, because, like I said, they've done thousands of one on ones just like you. You know, give me a little give me a little story time. You don't have to name the the companies, of course, but you know what what's been some of the more outrageous uh, experiences? Because hey, look, in microcap. There, you uh, without a doubt, there's some out, outrageous stuff that uh, I'm sure you've experienced in terms of like maybe lofty expectations, maybe just the CEO just being a bit of a wackadoo. You know, it is they're 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 still rampant. Yeah. So you so uh, a good story or a bad story or both? <laughs> both, man. With the, we got time, man. Let's go. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I would say like going back on, you know, like years ago. Before it became like, 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 I guess I'll, I'll try to reiterate that like these are obviously my own ideas and like they don't have anything to do with anyone else and just kind of in some ways because I don't want, you know, conflict of interest or whatever. I don't want that to be relevant. But, you know, I would say like years ago, I was like pretty early on into that move of like, 
let's say let's call it Rick's R I C K the the stock. Like maybe it was 2016. They came by our office, the uh, CEO and and um, IR guy Gary, and I I was just like, you know, like the business was cheap at the time. You know, the management team seemed like really solid. Like like the CEO just really knew the business like better than anyone else. And I mean, this is like nightclubs. These are like, you know, not like you know, kind of have, have, has kind of like a niche. So I, I just was like, really like, you know, I was just like, wow, this is something that could be really, really cheap. And most people were like, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's Rick's, you know, like they, they really had no interest. And like, I just, I, I mean, I just thought the CEO, like, you know, he had pretty big expectations, like very shareholder friendly, but he was like really, you know, like just, he really just really understood the business and, that passion I saw kind of when I walked into the room and like, you know, he just, he was a character, but you know, he, he had lofty expectations for himself, but like he's, I mean, the company's done well and they've kind of turned it around. And, and I guess, I guess it's not like a, an exciting story, but it's just one where like, you know, this is a few years ago and like, you know, no one had it on their radar. I guess that's like a good way of kind of putting it. And, you know, today it's like just, you know, much different business than it was even a few years ago. And they've just been able to grow. They got some multiple expansion. And I do own it still today, um, but I guess my point for bringing it up was it's just you know he's a character, but you know just I, I try not to write people off. I guess is my point, even if they are one hundred percent. And I should preface this question that there's a lot of very high quality people in microcaps. I didn't mean to do the whole whack of do thing because uh, you know the, yeah it's there, but there there really is a lot of high quality people that work in microcaps and and run these companies you know it's just you know sometimes when you do as many meetings as you have and you know see all the different ideas that come across your desk you know you definitely come across a few that you're just like i don't know i don't know I, we'll we'll see um but well, yeah i i would say there you know like i come across things where like sometimes i'm just like like what are they doing like i mean there's this microcap canadian company i own i guess i won't give a ticker symbol but it's it's like a you know media company and you know their core business was like documentaries and i thought it was like really you know i thought it was like interesting like content spend was cheap on the numbers and then now they're like gravitating into the nft space and um you know i yeah i i just i just like you know i still own a little bit of it because like i still like i mean maybe, maybe they're gonna pull it off but like it's just it's like you know, everyone kind of follows the trend in some ways, and that's the frustrating part. It's like NFTs became so popular, so now they want to have an NFT studio. So it's like, it's like, you know, like, I try not to write it off, but, you know, like, my confidence right now is a little bit less than the, you know, like it was when I first made the investment, even if it was a small position. I want to go down this rabbit hole, though, of, um, because it, it's seemingly a red flag, but sometimes it, it might be the right move. And that's this idea of, some of these companies kind of chasing that carrot, right? You know, whether it's NFTs, re, you know, and more recently, NFTs or in the healthcare space, you know, when it was developing a COVID vaccine or, you know, any kind of, you know, whenever there is, you know, some sort of endemic happening, you know, like developing that vaccine for that, you know, um, you know, that happens quite a bit in microcaps and, you know, they'll do it for, Sometimes they'll do it for the headlines. They'll see a bump in the stock or something like that. You know, maybe it is to just raise capital to fund some of their other stuff that there's part of the real core business, you know, or they're actually being very serious about that. You know, uh, in some, some respects, like I can think off the top of my head is getting into like the veterinarian space and developing some, you know, products and diagnostics and stuff like that for, for that vertical, you know? So in your opinion, you know, how you, discern when you're looking at a company that maybe makes that announcement or you're going to meet with them and you maybe saw recently like oh they're now doing this that's kind of a hot trend like how do i figure out whether or not that's something that's actually real and core to their business and really what they want to do moving forward or just you know for the headlines maybe potentially get a bump raise capital down the road yeah yeah i mean i think that's an excellent question i mean i think that's what it kind of comes down to at the end of the day i think the numbers are kind of like what it comes down to like you know, is this a business that, you know, has a kind of a stable legacy kind of business that kind of funds this type of investment? Or is it a business that's going to have to access the capital markets, to your point, and raise a ton of money? And, you know, they're just trying to stay alive. Like, I think that's like kind of what it comes down to. And I would say, like, you know, I think a good place to start sometimes is looking at those businesses that maybe ha has like a dying kind of cash flow stream. But like, you know, sometimes you gotta be wary when they, when they just chase after like, what's going to give them a higher multiple. That's why like, 
I think it comes down to the numbers and like what they're doing today and, and what, and how is that, how is this strategy going to be profitable and generate cash long-term? Like, I mean, I think companies kind of moved away from that when the market was really, you know, hot for a while. Like they just talked all about total addressable market. They didn't talk about actually making money. And so now you're starting to see kind of revert back to, this is how we're going to make money. This is how we're going to grow profitably. And so I think it's like kind of all in one and the same. It just really comes down to how are they going to finance this growth, really, in my opinion. 100%. Actually, that's that's my number, my favorite question to ask most companies, you know, the ones that aren't profitable when I have them on the due diligence series is what is your path to profitability? You know, and um, I think you can you can learn a lot from from that question. Right. I mean, that that that's why I like asking it, because at the end of the day, like if you're not if you're not going to really build a real business and you're just, you know, in growth mode constantly, you know, how often are you going to be either raising capital or need to raise capital or, you know, probably going to need to do more desperate things to keep the door, keep, you know, keep the doors open potentially. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think that's what, it, I think you nailed it. That's what it comes down to. It's just like, you know, people kind of ignored the financials for a while, but I think that's, you know, really going to tell the story sort of if, if, if it may, you know, at the end of the day, if they can support the strategy and if it makes sense and how can they make money sort of from doing it. Absolutely. Hey, so let's talk right now. I mean, look, we're, we're recording this on uh, October 24th. It's Monday. You know, it's a rainy day in New York <laughs> and freezing here in California. By freezing, I mean, it's in like, you know, in the mid 60s. You know, let's talk. Let's talk a little like current current trends. What's going on? What you're seeing in micro caps right now? You know, how are you approaching it? Are you kind of more digging into current ideas, whether or not to add more? Are you looking at more new ideas? You know, what, what's been going on for you? Yeah, so. I think I see kind of a few different buckets sort of of like what looks interesting in my opinion. Obviously, my own opinion, like everyone has their own way of kind of doing it. Um, you know, you kind of have things that are, you know, more consumer oriented, like retailers and things like that, that are trading at like, you know, that are going to get hammered with inflation, supply chain. Those are kind of the out of favor trade today, let's say, like long term. I mean, if you're some, not all the retailers are going to kind of end up in the same way, but some of them have better balance sheets because of COVID. They pay down a lot of their debt you know, they generate cash, they, they have a pathway to grow. And, but, you know, they might get hammered in the short term with inflation, supply chain issues. And so if you kind of look at what normalized earnings are, a lot of those stocks look really cheap, in my opinion, like just, just like maybe you pick the few best out of, out of that category. But, you know, a lot of them are niche, sort of, they have their own thing. And so that's like one area, like if you want to look out of favor, sort of like the things that people don't want to own today is obviously things that are very consumer oriented, uh, retail, and then even going back to like, you know, commodities, let's say like, you know, I don't really invest directly in like an oil and gas company or necessarily a, you know, uh, a, you know, like a EMP guy or something like that. But I, I'm, I'm always interested in kind of service service companies that maybe have end markets in those industries. So I'm kind of seeing, you know, in, in that industry overall and in commodities, it's like a lot of these companies like have the opposite problem where it's like they actually have strong earnings the last few quarters. And the market doesn't believe that they're sustainable. So they're all trading at very low, like, you know, earnings multiples or, you know, off of, off of today's numbers. And it's like, if you have a contrarian thesis that maybe inflation is going to be around longer and we might go through, you know, five, 10 years of this, like, there's an argument to be said that a lot of those are really cheap. And then there's also, you know, and then there's also an outlier, which is like, obviously all the tech stocks have gotten destroyed. And so maybe if you could find one or, uh, you know, if you could find something in, in that bucket that, you know, Maybe it doesn't have to depend on the capital markets. That is, you know, cash flow. Uh, it's in a good cash flow position, maybe like, or very, very close to the cusp of it. You know, maybe there's some op opportunities in there. So, I mean, I spent a lot of my time just trying to look at everything, I guess, because I just think like all that. And I think reevaluating things I have in my portfolio too, like that's always the battle, right? Like knowing when to sell something or when to buy something else. If something's trading at five times, you know, earnings, buying something else that's trading at four times earnings. Like, like it's a battle that you know everyone kind of goes through. Like, should I sell one thing to buy another? But, you know, I think at the end of the day, like there's just a lot of opportunities in this market. It's just like one of these, I mean, it could, it could take a while to play out and it could, you know, like maybe, maybe the new, maybe we're all kind of wrong about what new, the new, you know, like the new normal really will look like, I guess, down the road. Like, from an earnings perspective for some of these companies, but like, it just seems like there's just plethora of like opportunities of just, you know, different ways to kind of position your portfolio. And, and I don't recommend 
having like a hundred percent of your portfolio in like one of those different ways. But I mean, I think the person that has, you know, follows that similar type of trend and has their portfolio in a mix of kind of these different things, like whether it's retail, some of the commodity businesses, you know, um, maybe some tech a little bit too, that are really close to like the cusp of making money or, or, or really generating a lot of cash today, but people don't really care about it. Um, you know, I think those people will probably will do well over the next few years. That's just my opinion. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, do you, for BWR, sorry, for BRW, do you, do you manage your own money or is, or is fun, fun structure kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's a portion of my own money. It's like family money. And then it's a few okay. like very close family friends. It's really a really tiny, like small kind of strategy today, but I mean, you know, it's just friends and family. I would kind of classify it as. Got it. Yeah. Cause you know, one thing that's been coming up, you know, in the last like couple months and recent conversations with, you know, folks that, you know, are contrarian by nature are just excited about all the opportunities that are available right now is just having your own cash flow in order to deploy that. Right. You know, it's, it's hard because you're just like, Oh my goodness. Like this is such a, like another one. It's like for DJ Khaled, just another one, another perfect setup, you know? And you're just like, wait, do I sell from this you know, this position hasn't really done much in the last few years, maybe, you know, but here and then put it in this new one. I mean, how do you balance that? Because that, that, that I feel like has been the most difficult part for most uh, portfolio managers and fund managers and people managing money right now is that, you know, because for some of them, they're the uh, money inflows are slowing down a bit. It's been much more difficult environment to raise money. So they're like having to just like look around at what they have and having to really make those hard choices. I mean, what, what's your opinion on that? Or are you having kind of that same experience? Yeah. I mean, I'm having that same kind of battle every day. I feel like, I mean, I talked to my dad about a lot about this too. And it's like, ultimately the answer is if you're convinced that, you know, like the comp that the company you're thinking about investing in, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have better prospects to kind of get, you know, meaning, you know, like being a better investment, then obviously you want to switch it up, but it's like, it's, it's just such a unique environment where it's, it's really, a lot of things just seem really just thrown out with the, you know, just thrown out of the water sort of, and just, you know, across the industries, it's just, there's a lot of cheap things. And sometimes I guess historically with the way, you know, since we are looking for out of favor, small micro cap stocks, you do rely a little bit on buyouts to some extent, which, which kind of creates liquidity, you know, like, like something like you don't depend on them, but you know, when you have a lot of cheap stocks, a bit, private equity comes in, they buy some stuff like other, you know, competitors will buy the stock. So it's like, you know, you haven't really seen a lot of that in this market either. So it's like, you're really more in decision-making time where you're not getting bailed out in some ways because private equity is buying out your largest position. And therefore you have all this new capital to deploy. You have to be the one that has to really decide like, is this the best position I should have this capital invest in? Or is there a better, you know, position that has better long-term prospects that, that is better off kind of being deployed with capital? Right. Very good. All right. So, you know, this is my favorite question I ask everybody on here. Um, it, what would you say has been an investing experience that changed your career the most? Yeah, I would say, like, you know, there, there, there were probably... Like, like I, I think there's a lot of them in general that like have kind of paved the way sort of to like kind of how I think about the world and, and, and my investment uh, framework and style. I mean, I think when, you know, you own something like, I guess during the COVID time was a good example, like, cause that's when I was like more active, you know, I was in the business. Like I can't really speak to 2008, 2009, except for seeing it through my dad, you know, like kind of what it was like kind of owning things and the mistakes that people made and just like hearing from him sort of like what mistakes he made. But my own personal kind of investing, you know, like, like I think sometimes like I own this company, Taylor Brands, let's say, um, which was, you know, men's warehouse, uh, Joseph A. Bank, it, like pre, like right before COVID, let's say 2019. And, you know, I really thought that there, they, there was a chance they could turn the business around. And, you know, like I just, you know, it was, and then COVID happened and no one went to, no one bought suits anymore for the next like four years. Like people would be able to work in their like pajamas all day. And so like, you know, like, like, like I was wrong. Like, I mean, I think, I think that kind of helped me solidify too that. I don't want to run a book that has five positions because I mean, like as much, as much as I think I could be right about something, I could easily be wrong. And so like, I think managing risk is important. And especially like during, you know, like the downturns, like now, I mean, like the goal is 
you know, you, you're managing other people's money and you just want to, you know, like, I, I just wouldn't want to have, even if I was convinced that this company, Taylor Brands, is going to be like a 10 bagger, like I, I like still think it would be not really responsible to have all my money in like, you know, three, you know, two or three companies like them, like Taylor Brands, because there inherently are a lot of risks associated with it. You know, they were levered, you know, they were in an industry that was struggling. So I think on the, on the contrarian side, like that was definitely something that really taught me about portfolio concentration, just like the importance of not being like having like only a handful of ideas, but being a little bit more diversified and still kind of sticking to the theme of finding like, you know, out, looking for those like multi-baggers, but not just having a 30% position is something that you think could be a multi-bagger. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And I totally, I mean, look, there's many different ways we can skin this cat and there's many different ways to win and, and make money in this market. And, you know, that that's, that's something that you have to really come to from experience, right? This idea of, you know, how concentrated do you want to be if that's the type of strategy you want to go with? Or if you don't want to be as concentrated, well, how diversified do you really want to be, right? You yeah, know, that's, yeah, yeah. that's the question you have to ask yourself. Yeah, and you don't want to run like if you're managing money and you're trying to be like competitive, I guess, long term and, and, and try to run a, a strategy that might attract investors, like you don't want to match like the index, like word for word, right? Like you, you, people are giving you money because they won't think you'll do better than the index over time. So it's like a fine battle of like, what, what is the right number? Is it 100 positions? Is it 50 positions? Is it 25 positions? I mean, like, I think that's where people's personal kind of preferences kind of come into play. But for me personally, I think it's definitely closer to 25, 30 than it is to two or three positions. And that's just my own personal preference. 100%. All right. So we're, we're about there, man. I mean, we, we've covered, we covered quite a bit. So, um, you know, to close us out here today, what advice would you have for folks? Maybe that are listening in new to these types of markets, maybe even a little bit new to micro cap investing. How, what, what advice would you give them on how to approach wanting to deploy capital or not right now? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think kind of going through those like kind of different buckets of like, you know, like right now is a unique time where like, Everything is just like really out of favor. Multiples are pretty low. Uh, small caps and micro caps have historically been low for a while now, even kind of predating, you know, to where we are today. And I, I think just being, you know, like, like I think, you know, you got to be somewhat careful about companies with a lot of debt, you know, because interest rates are going up and like, you know, it's uncertain whether it is a different environment than it was even like two years ago. Like, like the idea that you're going to have easy access to refinancing and, be able to get a really cheap rate. So I would say, you know, I, and then say, having said that, I'm still like open to things that have debt, like four or five times levered. Like, you know, to me that that's, that's like, and, and they generate 20% free cash flow yield. To me, that's like somewhat like, you know, interesting still, but I would say kind of looking in those different buckets of just what, what are kind of the cheapest kind of areas of the market right now. And, and, which businesses do you think three, four, five years from now are going to be fine? And this whole thing is going to be like a, a non-factor for them. And it's just, they're getting carried, you know, thrown in with everything else. I mean, cause not every, not every business is going to end up being or reacting the same, you know, like, like there'll be some that might go bankrupt during this whole like experience because, you know, their business might deteriorate and they might not get the financing, but then there'll also be like companies that will be unharmed and their multiple just went down because everything in their industry went down. So I, I would say like just being, Knowing that there is always risk when you invest is important. Knowing that, you know, uh, the idea that you could be wrong and there's a good chance you might be wrong. I mean, I think having, I think it's important to accept that. And so having said that, I think being able to diversify in a couple of these like really areas that like, you know, you're convinced the balance sheet's in pretty good shape. They'll generate a lot of free cash flow. They're being very sh shareholder friendly in a lot of ways. Like they're using that excess cash, buying back a lot of stock. Or paying out special dividends where you kind of see the return that way. I think just angling your portfolio to mostly being like that, I think, you know, like, like it, there's always going to be something going on in the world, is my point. It's like, it, it wasn't this, it was 2020, you know, COVID, everyone thought the world was going to end. You know, 2008, 2009 was something terrible. Like, like, like maybe there'll be an alien attack one day. You know, like there's always going to be stuff that, like, that's going to come up that might, like, spook people and, like, scare people and, like, cause everyone to think the world's going to end. And there's always going to be negative articles about like, is the market going to die? Like stock market over, you know, is it like, are we going to go through a 20, 30 year bear market? And I guess I do talk a lot with my dad about it. And it's like, you know, over the last hundred years, if the next hundred years or anything like the last hundred years, like you're better off keeping your money in stocks. And, you know, I know it's a unique environment because 
rates are starting to go up and it's something we haven't seen for 40, 50 years, but you know, we'll survive this crisis. We'll survive it just like we survived, like, you know, adapting to every other type of unique market environment, you know, as, 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 as humans, you know? Absolutely. I think that's a great place to end it, Brian. So where, where can our audience go and find more information on you, BRW investors with body and also maybe follow you on social media as well? Yeah. Yeah. So you could, uh, send me an email. So I guess you could email me at my Rabati email address, which is bweber at rabati.com. Uh, I still check that. I still use that pretty often. Um, the partnership is like really like, I don't really market it to like really outside people, just really people I know. So like, there's not really a lot of information about that on there, but I'm hoping to kind of over time, you know, build a little bit of a, uh, of, of a track record. I mean, you know, be a little bit more kind of forthcoming talking about a little bit more, um, and then, you know, you can always friend me on LinkedIn as well, Brian Weber. Um, you know, uh, so, so, so we, you could always stay in touch that way as well. So there's a couple different options, I guess. Very cool. Well, Brian, th- thank you again so much for joining me today. This was really, really fun and great conversation. And uh, look forward to our next update. Thank you. Really appreciate, really appreciate you letting me join. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast podcast.